Hello, it's time for another lesson for the high school class for the Pepper Road Church of Christ. Our topic this quarter is the New Testament Church. All of the passages we are displaying on the slides today will be from the New American Standard Bible. Today's lesson, lesson 10, is how to become a member, and it is the fourth and final in our little mini-series of lessons within our greater topic of the New Testament Church on membership. So we'll look in this lesson at what the New Testament teaching has to say about how one becomes a member of the church. We'll look at a few comparisons that are made of church membership to other everyday ideas. And finally, we'll look at some New Testament church examples where those teachings of membership and how to become a member were put into practice. We'll look first at what Christ said in his teachings about what it means to become a member of the church. And I want you to recall back to our previous lesson about salvation and church membership and how those things were compared and how much very alike they are. Uh, and so some of that language will be the same that you hear in this lesson as you did in the previous lesson uh, when we talk almost interchangeably about salvation and church membership. How when one is saved, when he does the things that uh, bring about salvation according to the word when he meets the conditions for that he also meets the conditions for being added to the church but we'll first look first at uh, what christ had to say about that in his teachings and the first thing we'll notice that christ says about uh, becoming a member of his church or the language he uses here in john chapter 3 seeing the kingdom of god as he likens it that he likens it to that of being born again John chapter 3, we'll begin in verse 3. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Notice that this will not be the, you know, keep your, keep your eyes and ears open through the rest of the lesson. This will not be, not be the only time in this lesson we talk about the idea of, of birth being equated to becoming a member of the church or uh, meeting the conditions for salvation. As what's happening is we're putting something that's old and not wanted, the body of sin, to death, and we're starting something fresh. We're starting something new. And so it's a, it's a new birth, and it is, in fact, like we're being born all over again into a new world and acting differently as a, a different entity than we were before. Jesus also said that unless you're converted and become like little children, that is, you're, you're changed, uh, you're no longer the person you were, but you act and have characteristics of uh, that of a child, that of uh, willing to submit, willing to be humble, willing to uh, learn, you can know you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven unless you're willing to do that as well matthew chapter 18 first three verses at that time the disciples came to jesus and said who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven and he called a child to himself and set them before and set him before them and said truly i say to you unless you are converted and become like children you will not enter the kingdom of heaven so in order to become a member of Christ's kingdom, we have to be willing to change, um, put on that attitude of uh, humbleness, recognizing authority above us, that of a child, uh, in order to become a member. In the end of several of the Gospels, three out of the four, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, Jesus lists some of the conditions necessary to become a member of his kingdom and to be converted, to become a, a Christian, to meet the conditions for salvation. In Mark chapter 16, verse 15 and 16, he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has, been, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. So we see from this passage, and we've noted this in prior lessons before, that belief and baptism is required for salvation and for becoming a member of Christ's kingdom. Look in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18. And Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. 
Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We see from this passage again, baptism is mentioned as providing entrance into the kingdom of God, and that we have to learn uh, the commandments of Christ and observe those things if we want to be a successful member in Christ's kingdom. Look in Luke's account of the Great Commission, Luke chapter 24, verse 44. Now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. A couple of points here that, that adds commentary to what we read in Matthew about the teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. Some of that teaching involves understanding what was written about Jesus in the law and the prophets and the Psalms and how Jesus fulfilled those things, uh, that Jesus the Christ would suffer, he would die, he would raise from the dead on the third day. And now also as a condition for salvation and membership entrance into his kingdom, in addition to belief and baptism, we also add that of repentance, a changing, a turning. So we're starting to see uh, some of the holes filled in on what makes a member eligible for being a member in the Church of Christ. You'll notice in that last passage that we looked at in Luke chapter 24, towards the end of that passage, Jesus made note that the teaching that would be done would be done by the apostles. They would be witnesses of the things that they'd seen, that they had heard, and they would be the ones doing those that, that teaching. So let's look now at other passages in the New Testament that illustrate for us the things that the apostles taught about how to become a member of the church. The primary means of converting people to become members in Christ's kingdom, in his church, uh, to meet the conditions for salvation would be done through teaching. And in the first century, a lot of that teaching was, was done by uh, the apostles themselves. Paul writes here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21, For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believed. How was God going to go about telling people um, how they could be acceptable in his sight, how they could be part of Christ's body, how they could gain interest to his kingdom? He would do that through preaching. And the message that was preached would prove to be foolishness to some who thought with worldly wisdom. But those that were willing to believe the message that was preached, uh, it would bring about salvation for them. So the information necessary for one to understand how to become a member of Christ's church would be done primarily through preaching. It makes sense then that uh, an important aspect of becoming a member would be to hear that word, to understand it, and believe it. And that's exactly what Romans chapter 10 tells us. We'll begin in verse 14. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? How, they, how will they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? We see all of those things related directly right there. They, they have to have a preacher. You have to hear that preacher. Uh, and once you hear that preacher, you have to believe that preacher in order to make use of this message. How will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. However, they did not all heed the good news, for Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Not everyone would believe. So, verse 17, faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. The first step to becoming a member of Christ's church is to hear the word that is preached, the, to listen to the messengers that God has sent, and uh, hearing that, believe it. In fact, John emphasizes just how important it is to believe in the message preached and the consequences of not believing. In John 8, 24, Therefore, 
I said to you that you will die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. You're going to be lost. You're going to be dead in sin if you don't believe the message preached. So this first step of hearing and believing is, is the, the critical step for everything else to follow, for the change in heart to follow and the change in action and the, the obedient works that we're going to talk about. You have to hear this word and you have to believe it. Um, Mark 16, 16, we've already read this once tonight. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved, but he who has disbelieved shall be condemned. Look at the, the last part of that verse. Again, disbelief is associated with uh, condemnation. So it's important that we hear this word, we accept it, and that we believe it. That's, that puts us on uh, a good starting path to becoming a member of Christ's church. When the word has been preached, as God intended it to, and receptive ears hear the word, and they respond to that word through belief, that's going to bring about some changes in actions and attitudes. And so we see here the, the need for the, we see here the necessity of, of repentance, the need to, to change. Repentance is the idea of, of turning around, going one way, turning 180 degrees around and going back the other way. So the things that we do that were against what God wanted us to do, the sins that we were involved in, we're going to stop that. We're going to turn. We're going to do the things that God wants us to do. We're going to look for ways to serve him and be acceptable in his sight. Acts 3.19, therefore repent and return. Again, you see the idea of you're going away from God. You're going to turn. You're going to come back to God so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Luke says it in his gospel much more emphatically in verses in chapter 13 verse 5 and also verse 3 uh, he emphasizes it twice there in just a brief period of time i tell you no but unless you repent you will all likewise perish and he says the same thing in verse 5 unless you're willing to to change what you're doing you're going to perish just like those that we already looked at that would refuse to believe would be condemned those that refuse to repent will perish. It, regard, it requires a change of, of mind and a change of action on our parts to become a member of Christ's church. And one of those primary actions that we're going to do that demonstrate that we've heard and we've believed what we've heard and we're willing to make a change is to be baptized. Uh, in Galatians chapter 3 verse 26, Paul writes, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you, all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. So we see the process laid out for us uh, by the teaching of the apostles in the New Testament. Preaching is to be done. People will hear that preaching, and if they have a receptive mind and heart, they'll accept it, they'll believe it, they'll make changes in their lives, and they'll demonstrate those changes um, through that first act of obedience, where the command is to be baptized, and they do just exactly that. Uh, showing that they're putting on Christ like a, like a garment. That's how closely they'll be uh, intimated with Christ. Let's say a word about obedience in this whole process. There's many that, that have for many years in the denominational world wanted, wanted to throw out obedience, to say it's, it's all about uh, faith and, and God or Jesus will do the rest. But we see that obedience is a critical part of our becoming a member of Christ's kingdom, of his, of his church, because it demonstrates that faith. It demonstrates that belief and that willingness to change. Uh, it's sort of the culmination of all of, all of those other items that, that lead up to this. So we have to demonstrate obedience. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, since you have an obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren fervently love one another from the heart so by obedience to the truth you're making yourselves pure you're getting rid of the the things that you would do selfishly or the things that would taint you from the world and you're doing the things that god asks you to do the things that will make you pure that will make you um, separate and apart and we'll talk more about that later we've talked about that in previous lessons uh, you'll be different from the world. Obedience is what demonstrates that difference from the world. Uh, because as, as we read here in Romans chapter 16, Paul says you're going to be a slave to someone. You're going to be a slave to sin. 
or you're going to be a slave of righteousness. And the better choice is to be the slave to righteousness. You're going to serve someone no matter what. And that's a tough concept, particularly for us uh, Americans to have. You know, we're, we're free. We, we don't serve anybody. Uh, but when we don't do what God wants us to do, when we're not obedient to his word, and we do what our lusts tell us to do, what our uh, fleshly, selfish desires, when we just do what we want to do, uh, we're a slave to sin. That's all there is to it. Romans chapter 6, verse 17. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. And being a slave of righteousness is so much better than being a slave of sin. So we see that obedience is a critical component in being a member of Christ's church. It's, it's the culmination of all these, these other conditions that we uh, meet and these experiences that we go through, the hearing of this word and believing it and, and repenting. Obedience is the culmination of that. Another thing that the apostles mention in their teaching is that uh, being led by the Spirit is a description of those that are members of Christ's church. Romans chapter 8, for, verse 14, For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And we're not talking about some uh, mystical, warm, fuzzy feeling inside of us when we talk about being led by the Spirit. If you think all the way back to our, our first lesson when we talked about the authority of the church, we talked in particularly about the authority of the apostles and, and, and what authority they had. Where did they get their information? Well, if you look back in John chapter 14, 15, and 16, over and over again, Jesus promised them this comforter. And the things that the comforter, the Holy Spirit, would do is, is he would um, bring the teachings of Christ to remembrance. He would make them understand teachings of Christ that they had previously not understood. Uh, he would make them able to understand and effectively teach everything that they needed to with regard to the kingdom of heaven. And so when someone is led by the Spirit, they're being led by those words, that, that doctrine that was taught all the way back from the, the day of Pentecost. They're being, they're being led by that. And as long as they adhere to that, they are indeed sons of God. And finally, as we look through the, the teachings of the, the New Testament, what the apostles had to say about becoming a member of Christ's church, we go back to that point that we made at the very beginning of this little mini-series on church membership, that as members of his kingdom, of his church, we're going to be washed, we're going to be holy, sanctified, set apart, justified. Um, our lives will be evident that we're in service of our king, and we're not like the world around us. The, the Corinthians certainly weren't like the world around them. The city in Corinth was known for its immorality, and they had been a part of that immorality, but not anymore. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, Such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our Lord. We put aside that commonality with the war world when we become a member of the church. We wash that filth of sin off of us, and we set ourselves apart for work in Christ's kingdom. Earlier in the book, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, To the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Again, the idea that we are sanctified, we are different from the world around us. And as a member of the church, if you're not willing to do that, you're not going to be a member of Christ's church. So we've seen through the teachings of Christ and the teaching of his apostles, basically what it takes to be a member. There's God intended for his word to be preached, spoken word, written word, for people to hear that and believe it, for them to make a change in their lives, culminated by obedience, the obedience of baptism, to be led by his word, to continue doing uh, the things that he asked them to do that they, they would find in his word, uh, to be pure, to be set apart, to be sanctified. That's what it takes to become a member of the church. Uh, let's look now at a few New Testament figures, um, comparisons, if you will, that 
as we paint these pictures, we can see um, how our relationship with the world is different, how our relationship with our God is different if we decide to become a member of his church. The first figure at which we'll look from the New Testament is the idea of becoming a member of Christ's kingdom is that of a new birth. You're something different that you weren't before. It's a, it's a, a new start. Um, there's some details we could dig into in each of these passages, but I want you to think in general terms of when I become a member of the church, I'm something different that I wasn't before. Uh, I think that's the main point of these passages at which we're going to look. Is, is I'm different than I was before, something better than I was before. And, and often cases you can think of, I've put something that was not good, I've put it away, I've put it aside, I've killed it, and this is what has risen up from the ashes of it. Um, something, something new, something better, something God-centered. Look in John chapter 3 and verse 3. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly I say to you, unless one is born, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And we see that it really is a, a revolutionary concept. Nicodemus had trouble with it, and if we give serious thought to it, it should cause us pause before we make this decision to become a member of Christ's church, to enter into service in his kingdom. It's that life-changing. It's, it's like starting over again. From whatever you've lived your life up to this point, it's completely different now. You're going to live life differently. Let's look at some other passages that, that further illustrate this point. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, For you have been born again, not of a seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living and enduring word of God. What we were previously, it was perishable. It was something that would be destroyed, that was decaying. Not anymore. Um, we've, we've put that corrupt body aside, and we've put on incorruption. Um, something that is not perishable, something new and different. James chapter 1 and verse 18, in the exercise of his will, he brought us forth, the idea of birth there, by the word of truth, so that we would be kind of first fruits among his creatures. We were born out of the, the word of truth. We've we heard the preaching, we accepted the preaching of the word of God, and now we're we're different. We're, we're a first fruit among his creature, his 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 creatures and his creation. And designed and um, committed to doing his word. In fact, Paul often considered those that he taught to be his his children, like he had been the one that had, had brought them forth. He had done that teaching that brought about such a change in their lives that started a new beginning for them. 1 Corinthians 4.15, For if you were to have countless tutors in Christ, yet you would not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. I taught you, you accepted the teaching, and you began your life anew. You had a, a new birth, so to speak, in how you live your life. So what I want you to see from these passages is just how completely and distinctly, when we become a member of Christ's church, we're beginning our lives anew, different and, and completely separate from the lives that we had before as far as what our priorities are and the, the service that we offer. It's no longer to ourselves or to those around us. It's to our God. Specifically, this new birth is said to be of water and spirit. John 3, 5, which we've already read, Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And water is a reference to, to water baptism. And Spirit, as we've talked about earlier, the, the role of the, the Spirit in this is, is the revealing of the Word to the Apostles, which then, they then revealed to, to us, or, or what they would do in, in the future with reference to John chapter 3. So when one is born of water and born of Spirit, it's speaking of that new beginning that starts when they're baptized and from then on, their guide is the Word of God. They are led by the Spirit, which 
does that leading through the revealed word of God. Galatians chapter 3 verse 26, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. And again, baptized with Christ, you've, you've put on Christ. It's, it's, a, it's a new way of life for you. It's a, a new beginning. So being born of the water and of the spirit. We'll tie one more passage into this particular concept, Acts chapter 2, beginning of verse 38, in the sermon that Peter and the other apostles are teaching there on the day of Pentecost. Peter said to them, repent and each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Again, we see those two items. We see uh, to start this new beginning, we see baptism and we see the Holy Spirit. Uh, the, 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 the revealing power of the Holy Spirit in the word of God. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then, those who had received his word were baptized, and that day were added about 3,000 souls. A new beginning. Baptism was the the the, the date stamp on that new beginning. So uh, truly a new birth, baptism and the following of, of God's revealed word to us, it starts a, a new chapter in our life. The, the way we've done things in the past is, is not the way we do things anymore. Let's look at a second figure or, or, or picture that will illustrate for us uh, the changes that come over us when we become a member of Christ's church. And it's a figure we've looked at several times that we've talked about this, this New Testament church and being members of it. And that's the idea of marriage and that we're married to Christ. Read now in Ephesians chapter five, starting verse 22, wives be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the word, the washing of water with the word, and that he might present to himself uh, the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. Now, all of you are a, a little bit young for uh, a, a marriage analogy, but you can understand what, what he's trying to stay here, or, or hopefully you can give some thought to it and, and say, yeah, I, I believe that to be true. When one chooses to marry, your life changes dramatically. It's supposed to. That's the, the Bible way, maybe not the way of the world today. But when one chooses to marry, two distinct lives are gone and now one intertwined life, life uh, remains in its place. And so the way that we did things before is not the way we do things now because we have the consideration of our spouse. Um, if before, if, if I just wanted to go off and do something before I was married, I would go do that. But now that I'm married to, to Jenny, you know, that's a discussion that we have on is that what's best for this relationship, for this, this family? Um, and I give consideration to her and I do what's best for the marriage relationship rather than what's best for my personal relationship. And I keep myself uh, separate and pure for my spouse. And that's the type of relationship that God talks about here, or Paul talks about here rather, in Ephesians chapter 5 about um, Christ and what he does for the church and what he expects of the church. Again, we've mentioned it several times, that, that holy, sanctified, without spot, without blemish. Incidentally, looking back at the idea of, of born of water and the spirit, look at verse 26. I meant to bring this up in the, the previous point. So that he might sanctify her, Christ the groom, sanctifying uh, the bride, the church, having cleansed her by the washing of water, baptism with the word, water and spirit, water and the word. So we see that uh, image brought up again, but Christ is expecting uh, an exclusive relationship 
And so when we think of being a member of his church, we need to think exclusively. We exclusively belong to our Lord. Finishing out this reading in Ephesians chapter 5, so husbands ought to also love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. So those are the blessings and benefits we get when we're willing to be in a, an exclusive relationship uh, with our God, Christ. Romans chapter 7 and verse 4, Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, that you might be joined to another, that idea of marriage, You're, uh, to him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. Similar to this idea of the new birth, this marriage, it's, it's a new beginning in our lives. We we, we stop the old way of life. We die to the law through the body of Christ so that we might be joined to another. We're exclusive to Christ now. So just as a new birth is a new beginning, uh, a new marriage is a new beginning. And so when we marry ourselves to Christ, and we talked about how the church is the bride of Christ, um, it's a new beginning for us and it's exclusive for us. We belong to him and we uh, serve only him. We'll continue looking at these next three passages, again, focusing on this figure of being married or, or the changes that happen in a marriage relationship. And so what I want you to see from these three passages are just the, the closeness of relationship that often is exhibited in the, the marriage relationship. Uh, look at John 6, 44 and 45. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be taught of God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. So there's this drawing uh, to God and, and, and Jesus assisting in that and coming to Jesus. Again, this, this acquaintanceship, this closeness of relationship that's there, much like what's in a marriage relationship. 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. Love is certainly a a central theme in any good marriage relationship. And we need to exhibit love because that's how we see our, our spouse, Christ, uh, exhibiting love towards us. And just the intimacy there, as again described in Galatians 3, we've read this passage, we'll read it again briefly. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves in Christ. Just like the marriage relationship is the closest relationship physically on earth that we'll have. You know, it's like we're putting on Christ as, as another garment. That's how close he is to us. So we see through, through these two figures, that of a new birth and, and that of the marriage relationship, that when we decide to become a member and we meet the conditions of membership, uh, things start anew for us compared to how we've lived our lives in the past. And I know I've said that uh, a lot in these last, I don't know, 10, 10 minutes, sometimes in different ways, sometimes in the, in the same way, but I can't emphasize that enough. When you become a member of Christ's church, everything should change for you. You're not living for yourself anymore. You know, uh, your life doesn't revolve around the activities that it revolved around prior to becoming a member. Now everything revolves around Christ. Uh, you are a slave to righteousness and you're going to do everything that you can um, and everything that you find to do revealed in the word of God to be pleasing to God. It truly is a new beginning, just like a new birth would be, just like a, a, a new marriage would be. I don't know that I've said this yet in this quarter, but one of the one of the best ways to see a Bible point, I mean, you can look at, you can look at the, the doctrine taught, the words, uh, but when I can go back to the New Testament and I can, I can establish a pattern, I can see an example. Uh, to me, that's just a useful tool for learning and for teaching someone else. Let's look at some New Testament examples in the first century that show people becoming members of Christ's church and see if, if they, uh, if, if that process falls in line with the things that Christ has said, the things that the apostles have said, these New Testament figures that we've uh, examined. Uh, 
let's look at these New Testament examples and see if they match up. As you might expect, our first example is going to be the church at Jerusalem that was um, established on the day of Pentecost. That's the one that probably comes to your mind first, and that's the one we'll look at first. Um, we're going to read a few select verses from Acts chapter 2. We'll make a, a few comments as we go along. Again, look for the things that were established in the teaching. Look for the the preaching of the word, the hearing of the word, the believing of the word, the, re the repentance that call to action uh, and the obedience primarily that through baptism and then continue in obedience look for those things as we look at, at this example and then look at examples the the other examples at which we'll look so acts chapter 2 verse 22 men of israel listen to these words jesus the nazarene a man attested to you by god with miracles and wonders and signs which god performed through him in your midst just as you yourselves know this man, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. God sent his God had a plan. God sent his son. You killed him. That was God's plan. God raised him from the dead. This is the preaching that's going on. Um, we'll continue here on the next slide with more verses. Again, God sent his son. You killed him. This was God's plan. God raised him from the dead. And now we see here in verse 32 that God raised him from the dead and exalted him. And he's now sitting at the right hand of God. This Jesus God raised up again to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. Gospel preaching, what's going to be the response to it? The culmination of this sermon on the day of Pentecost in verse 36 beginning, Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So he's preached this sermon, what's going to be the response? Now when they heard this, remember, you have to preach, you have to hear the preaching, then you have to accept the preaching. What will they do? They were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brethren, what shall we do? It sounds like they are affected by this preaching. They've heard it. Now they believe it. They want to know how they can change. Uh, Peter said to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so just as as we looked through the, the previous teaching and the, and the steps that would make one a member we see that's what these um, people at Jerusalem are doing and are being instructed to do. How will these recipients of the sermon respond to the message now? They've been told uh, the gospel story. They've believed it. They've said, how can we change our ways? Peter has told them how to do that. Will they accept it? Verse 41, so then those who had received his word, heard it, believed it, were baptized and that day were added about 3,000 souls. So now we see that that one of those later components coming in, that of obedience starts with baptism and it goes from there. They're willing to demonstrate the faith that they have uh, gained by hearing this word and believing it. Look with me a few chapters later in the book of Acts as the Christians in Jerusalem are scattered. They go everywhere preaching the word Philip ends up in Samaria, and let's see if this, this pattern again holds true. We won't go into much as much detail as we did with those in Jerusalem, but just in general, see if the same thing is happening for folks to become members of the church. Acts 8, verse 12, but when they believed, Philip's pre believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. Again, just very succinctly, it's put to us that there's a preacher, he's preaching, people are hearing, they're believing, and they're acting, obeying on that belief, and they're being baptized. So we see that pattern again. One more New Testament example for you to consider. We'll go to the city of Corinth. This is Acts chapter 18. Uh, the scripture reference in your lesson is actually incorrect. It's not verse 18, it's verse 8. So this is Acts 18, verse 8 that I have displayed here on the slide. Paul was in Corinth. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians which 
uh, when they heard, were believing and being baptized. So again, we see the idea of someone preaching, that message being heard and believed, and people acting on it through obedience. Um, the first act of that obedience, or one of the first acts of those obedience, is, uh, is baptism. And so we've seen that pattern repeated over and over uh, in these examples at which we've looked. And if you were to look at any example of conversion in the book of Acts, of which there are several, you'll find this same pattern. Someone brings the gospel message. That gospel message is heard. It affects the people who hear it, and they believe it, and they act on it. And they do so by, by repenting, by stopping whatever sinful practices they're doing and turning around and doing what God wants them to do. Um, they confess God. They'll proudly proclaim that they are a Christian. And the, the first thing that they really do to demonstrate that faith is they're baptized for the for the remission of sins. We see that over and over again in the books, the book of Acts. And it's always, as I mentioned at the beginning of the section, it's always comfort, comforting for me uh, when I study something in the Bible, if I can see a pattern and I can be confident in that pattern. And the Bible pattern for becoming a member of Christ's church is rock solid throughout the book of Acts. Someone preaches, the recipients hear, they believe, they repent, they're back, and they're obedient. Um, and so we can take great confidence in that pattern. In this lesson, we looked on how to become a member. What does the Bible have to say about becoming a member of Christ's church? And one thing, we, we, we haven't, I haven't emphasized this a lot throughout this lesson, but Go back to that previous lesson on salvation and church membership. The things that we talked about tonight, just like them, you, you can't be saved without being a, a member of the church. You can't be a member of the church with, with, without being saved. The two are intertwined inextricably uh, with each other. And I want to emphasize that point uh, because, again, in this day and age, that's not a point that, that people want to recognize. But the Bible clearly states that. So we've looked at what what Christ said about becoming a member, what his apostles said, and, and particularly those steps to go through that makes one a member of Christ's church. We've looked at some New Testament figures, namely that of, of being born again and being married, and what a stark change that is from a, a previous life. It is a new beginning. Both of those situations are drastically new beginnings. And we, when we become a member of Christ's church, we begin life anew, and it's nothing like the life that we had previously. Finally, we've looked at examples, uh, Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, uh, the Samaritans that heard Philip's preaching, uh, the Corinthians that heard Paul's preaching, and really any example you want to go to of conversion in the book of Acts would show the same thing. A preacher preaching the word of God, that was God's design. People hearing it, people believing it and accepting it, and because of that, making changes in their lives, repenting demonstrating obedience, particularly through the initial act of baptism and then continuing on through obedience and being guided by the word of God revealed to man through the Holy Spirit. Uh, the plan is, is pretty simple and it's become very convoluted in today's world. And I want you to uh, wade through all the, the arguments that people will throw at you about what constitutes uh, salvation, what constitutes being a member of Christ's church, whether it's necessary to be a member of Christ's church, to be saved, and go to the Bible, look at these passages that we've looked at the last couple of lessons, and see how they are inseparable. Um, God tells us plainly what it means to be a member of his son's church and to be in a saved state with regard to God. And we can know that, and we don't have to guess what that is. And so we should take confidence in the clarity in God's word, and we should follow God's word. And ourselves follow this process to become a member of his church if you, if you have not done so. Again, I look forward to our study again together. I'm, I'm fingers crossed that soon we will be together in person. We'll have much more uh, two-way conversations than just one-way conversation. But I hope to see you face-to-face -face very soon.